got a very interesting question for you. What's your immune system? Do you know it's a word that we use so much, isn't it? Oh, my immune system must be down, that's why I've got a cold, but what is your immune system? What is your immune system? I'd like to have a look tonight at what your immune system is because it's important to know something about the house you live in, isn't it? And isn't it the most important yet the most neglected form of education is the house we're living in, knowing something about the body that we live in? Was that an eye-opening to you, what happens to your food? <laughs> that all your food's not digested in your stomach, it's actually digested in different parts of your gastrointestinal tract. One of my favorite Proverbs, it's Proverbs 14 verse six, knowledge is easy to him that understands. My, my aim is to give you an understanding of these things and then you automatically have the knowledge on how to treat this amazing body that we've been given. So I'd like to begin by looking at where the immune system starts. Now look at our human body. We've got a protection around the body. It's called skin. Is that right? Skin. And when you break the skin, you have to be careful. Because if you break the skin, now the flesh and the blood's exposed, and the microbes that are in the air, especially if there's some pathogens, they can get in there. Is that right? And it's like the little boy that I met in New Zealand a few years ago. He, he came with his mother. His mother came to see me about another issue. And when he walked in, his finger was twice the size. And I said, aha, uh -huh, what's, what's happening to the finger? Now, the finger was twice the size. It was red. And at the top, it like had a pussy area. She said, oh, it's cellulitis. The doctor said it's cellulitis. Do you know what cellulitis is? inflammation of the cell. Now, that's not rocket science, is it? It's inflamed. So I went a little bit further. Why? She said, well, he had a blister and the blister broke and then he's playing in the dirt with his matchbox cars. What's gonna happen next? And of course, little boys don't care if they've got a wall of flesh. So of course, the dirt got in there and immediately, his immune system went to the area. The lymphatic fluid, do you know your lymphatic system is your body's vacuum cleaner? That's the puffiness, it's the lymphatic fluid going there. Going there to try and block any microbes going to other parts of the body. And then, and then extra blood sent there and white blood cell, cells go there and then they lay down their lives, that's what pus is. Did you know that's what pus is, it's dead white blood cells. That's what happens. As we go through the lecture, I'm going to show you what we did to that finger. So your skin. So whenever the skin breaks, we've got to be careful to wash it, clean it and bind it, don't we? Until it seals to protect it. There are orifices. Let's have a look at the ears. Amazing protection in the ears. There's all these little hairs and then there's an eardrum to protect from any harmful pathogens getting in. Let's go to the eyes. What an amazing thing is the eye. If something hits you, you've got two bones there to protect it. And if something's flying through the air, you've got eyelashes and they blink. And the blinking reflex and the lashes stop anything getting in the eye. But if something actually gets through that and into the eye, then we've got this mucus layer around the eye and we know if we get something in the eye, like a bug or something, we just have to go around the world for a few times, is that right? And it'll go to the corner, and by now it's dead because all the, the mucus has drowned it and we can flick it out of the eye. Then we come to the nose. What an amazing organism is the nose. Did you know that in the nose there are all these little hairs? And in the nose, there are, it's like a cave with all these little cavities. And if we breathe in something that's got dust on it, it's heavy. If we breathe in pure air, it is so light, it goes straight through into the trachea and down into the lungs. But if it's got a bit of dust or something on it, it's heavier. 
So when it comes into the nose, it starts ricocheting around all those little cavities. It shoots backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards to drop off the dust. Then it becomes light and it goes back down the trachea and into the lungs. And then at the end of the day, we blow our nose. Is that right? Especially we've been digging in the garden. So those hairs there are there to trap any, any dust or things like that are on it. And then we come to the mouth. Do you know there's no hairs in your mouth? That's why we should be nose breathers, not mouth breathers. We should be nose breathers. And if someone says, well, I can't breathe through my nose, so then I ask, why can't you breathe through your nose? Well, it's all blocked up. So why is it blocked up? Oh, it's just always blocked up. Do you know excess mucus in that area indicates that that person's got an allergy? It might be to an allergy to a chemical. Uh, it might be allergy to a mold, maybe they're breathing in, or it could be an allergy to the food they're eating. And the three most common allergens are wheat, the hybridized wheat of today, dairy, and refined sugar. So one of the most common symptoms of someone having an allergy is their constant mucus, constantly blowing their nose. That should not be. You see, the body creates mucus to, to protect the mucus membranes from something they've got an allergy to. So then we come to the mouth. So we should be breathing through our nose. And you can breathe through your nose if, if, if it's clear. One lady said, I tried running up the hill and just breathing through my nose, but I couldn't. I said, no, either can I. Aren't you glad that when you're exercising and you need more air, you can breathe through both? <laughs> so let's go into the mouth. And you'll find in the mouth, there's bacteria in the mouth. There's a lot of mucus in the mouth. And that also can trap any pathogens. And let's swallow and get down into the stomach. Down in the stomach, and we just looked at that, there is a major part of your immune system, it's called hydrochloric acid. And if any harmful pathogens get into your stomach, your hydrochloric acid can wipe it out. The hydrochloric acid has quite a few roles. But what say your hydrochloric acid is low, and what say your um, gut bacteria is low. Do you remember when we went down into those areas, then harmful pathogens can get into the blood. And now the harmful pathogens are in the blood. And then rises up what most people see is the main part of their immune system, which is your white blood cells. Have you heard of your white blood cells? We all have white blood cells, and there's one white blood cell to about 10,000 red blood cells. And there are five different types of white blood cells. So 62% of our white blood cells are neutrophils. They make up the most part of the white blood cells. And then 18% are monocytes. That's another type of white blood cell. And then 16% are made up of lymphocytes. Now lymphocytes, lympho, lymphocytes are the white blood cell that's made in your lymph nodes. So your, your lymphatic system is like your body's vacuum cleaner. And what does the vacuum cleaner vacuum up? Waste. So your lymphatic system sucks and sweeps up waste from the tissues, takes it to the nodes. Your lymph nodes are in your neck, in your armpits, and in your groin. They're your main lymphatic nodes. And in those nodes are lymphocytes. So some of the waste that's taken into those nodes can be basically dealt with by those white blood cells. And then 2% of your white blood cells is made up of basophils. And then another 2% is made up of eosinophils. So that's your white blood cells. They're your internal army. 
and they are designed to wipe out any harmful pathogens that may get into your blood. Now your lymphocytes, they are the scouts. They're looking around for any problems. And when they see a problem, they can call on the, you know, the neutrophils and the monocytes to come along. And they use hydrogen peroxide to actually wipe out any of the problems. And they envelope them and wipe them out. And they, they actually die when the pathogen is killed. That's why the little boy had that pus there, because a lot of white blood cells had gone there to deal with what was coming in on the dirt. That's what pus is. And that's why a smoker, he'll often be coughing up green or yellow lumps. <laughs> and some people say he's got an infection. He hasn't got an infection. <laughs> it's just cleaning up the damage from all those years of cigarette smoke. You see, your body can heal itself. My sister is a senior science teacher and when she teaches immunology to her senior students, when she finishes, she says, see, the body is designed to heal itself. So when we've got any type of problem in the body, what makes sense is to boost your white blood cells. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now, one way to boost them is a fever. And fevers have been used for centuries to boost the white blood cells to clean up any problems that might be in the body. So at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, every afternoon our guests, our guests go into a steam sauna. And the steam sauna, usually the temperature sits at around 46 degrees and you get very hot. And we give you a bucket of cold water with a little face cloth in it and you can keep your head cool because the only part of your body that doesn't like getting hot is your head, your brain. And about every 10 minutes, you can get out of that hot, run down the steps and dive into the mountain stream. And if you're not agile enough to run down the steps, there is a cold shower that you can do there. Some people say, cold shower? I said, you're, gonna, you're wanting one because you get so hot and then back in the steam bath. And you might do that for about another 10 minutes and then charge out and dive in the cool pool again. You only need the cool for about 10, 15 seconds and then back into the hot sauna. Now, by the time you've, you've been 10 minutes in the third session of heat, your body temperature is usually up to about 40 degrees. That's a fever, yeah? Now, when your body is up to a fever state, and remember, the only part of your body that doesn't like getting hot is your brain. And because you're running and diving in the mountain pool and then running back and keeping the head cool, your brain, your brain keeps quite good. So when your body temp gets up to 40 degrees, your white blood cells sometimes can triple. Your metabolic rate increases by 400%. Wow. <laughs> Do you know what that means? Healing increases by 400%. Your, your blood zooming around your body. Now, why is your blood the healer? Let's have a look at blood. Why is it the healer or the life of the flesh? It contains red blood cells and it contains white blood cells. And there your white blood cells there. So what does the red blood cells contain? They carry oxygen. Oxygen, the most vital element needed for life. Cancer cannot live in the presence of oxygen. Makes a lot of sense to boost oxygen. Red blood cells also carry your nutrients. They're carrying nutrients to the cell. Do you remember we've been looking at the CBD, the central business district of the human body, the inside working of the cells, what it is your, your blood that carries these nutrients and this oxygen to the cell. It also carries the water and it also carries away the waste. Carries away waste, so, so no wonder it's called the life, the life of the flesh. So let me, let me explain to you what we did for the little boys, only seven with the finger. I said, what have you been doing? She said, well, he's on his second course of antibiotics but this is 10 days on antibiotics. And I'm thinking, how could it have looked much worse than it is? Is it working? 
He's on his second course of antibiotics. Um, he's taking painkillers and sleeping tablets to sleep at night. Ugh. He's seven. I'm not criticizing the mother. <laughs> what do you do? I said, can I try something? She said, please. So what I did was I got two mugs. And in one mug, I put hot water. Now when you have a hot shower at night, and the last two nights when I've got home, I've had a hot shower and it almost hurts at first. I didn't realize how cold I got. <laughs> and it's ah, stimulating, yeah? It's very nice, because we're warm-blooded creatures, so how we love the warm. So the hot water, when you initially apply it to the human body, it has a stimulating effect. It stimulates. But I think it's probably only about three minutes before I'm getting very relaxed, is that right? And everything's slowing down. It's like you get into a hot bath. At first it's tingling, and then you can just about fall asleep. Is that right? So after three minutes, we get to a depressed, it's actually a depressed state of blood flow. Everything's slowing down, slow or depressed. And then I got a mug that had cold water in it. Now this is New Zealand, so we didn't have to put ice in it. If you're in Brisbane, you have to put ice in it. It's gotta be very cold. The hotter the hot, the colder the cold, the more powerful the reaction. But I'm not gonna make this little boy put that sore finger in very hot water. I get him to put his good finger on and get him comfortable with that and then put the sore finger in, ouch. I said, just keep dipping it, it's too hot. Okay, put a bit of cold in. You gotta work with the will of the person. When you put that finger in cold water, it stimulates. In fact, it's not unusual at Misty Mountain Health Retreat to hear screaming when people dive into the cold creek. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed? <laughs> it stimulates. It takes 30 seconds once you're in the cold before we get to a depressed state of the blood everything starts to slow. So either called depressed or slow, it's a slowing down. So what I do is I put the finger in the hot for three minutes and then I put it in the ice cold for 30 seconds. And while it's in the ice cold, I put a little bit of boiling water into the hot to bring it up to the hot. He's watching me, so I say, put your good finger in. Are you happy with that? Yes, because I know once his finger's been in the cold, it'll handle more hot, numbs it a little bit. And then we keep it in the hot for how long? Three minutes. And then before it's got a chance to slow down, we plunge it back into the cold. And then before it's got a chance to slow down, we plunge it back into the hot. Can you see what we're doing? And you usually do that three times. So how long did that take? That takes hmm, 10, 11 minutes. By the end of the second hot, a big smile came to the little boy's face. What's happening? He's getting relief. In fact, by the end of the three, no, what was that? Uh, 12 minutes, and he's got 50% reduction in his pain levels. Now that's quicker than Panadol, is that right? And we're not hurting his kidneys, or his stomach, or his liver. He's looking at me smiling, and he's looking at his mother, and then I wrapped the finger in a grated potato poultice. Potato reduces inflammation. Potato draws waste out. Every home has a potato wrap. So I made a little, like a package. You can watch my poultice lecture to see how to do that on, on YouTube. And then I'll put a bit of plastic over it and bandage it up and ask God to bless that finger, bless that poultice. Do you know the rest of the morning while I'm talking to his mother, he's just smiling at me. Because <laughs> he had so much relief. When they went home, he said to his mother, can we do that again? Why did he say that? Because he'd experienced the relief. 
So I saw them at 10, we did it at 10 in the morning, they did it again at two, they did it again, I think just before he went to bed. And in the morning when they took it off and took the poultice off, all the waste came out. The finger was back to normal. No need for any more painkillers, no need for any more sleeping tablets. And the mother said, what will I do about the antibiotics? I said, I'll leave that up to you. I have no authority over what you do with that. All I can do is to tell you what I would do and I don't usually have to tell people what I would do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he got more relief with those simple treatments. What did I do? I boosted his immune system. I boosted his white blood cells because all I did was increase blood flow to that finger and is your blood, is your healer. That's the healer. So how important that you've got well hydrated blood. How important that you've got good nutrients in that blood because you're eating a plant-based diet, lots of vegetables, greens, fruits, nuts, grains, legumes. How important that you are drinking adequate water. You just, gotta, you just gotta make sure that blood's good. <laughs> now I could do those hot and cold treatments on a person who's not drinking water, not eating nourishing food, and will actually still get a result, but it's not gonna be as good. How simple. You see, your blood is your healer. Not only does your blood contain all the nutrients that you need for healing, it also contains your internal army, your, your immune system, so to speak, that will wipe out any harmful pathogens. In fact, our body's got everything we need for healing. One of the best blood cleansers that there is, is your greens. You see, the molecular structure of human blood looks like that and the molecular structure of plant blood looks like that. Would you say that's almost identical? But with human blood, the middle structure is iron. With plant blood, the middle molecule is magnesium. That's the only difference. And things like green barley, spirulina, wheatgrass, they're one of the best blood and tissue cleansers there is, that chlorophyll is a gray, has a great cleansing action on the body. So if the mother said to me, can we do something to even help the blood cleanse? I'd say, yeah, have, have a little green barley supplement. Green barley's not easy to take, but if you put it in lemon or grapefruit juice, it's a, a little bit easier. <laughs> a little bit easier to take. So when someone says to me, I, I think my immune system was down, I've got a cold, do you know the immune system's high? Because when you get a cold and when you get a fever, your white blood cell count can almost triple. A cold is a house clean, it's just a house clean. And every time you blow your nose, what are you blowing out? Waste. <laughs> your body's cleaning the house. That's why they'll never find a cure for the common cold because it's just one of the body's ways of getting rid of waste. But if you're drinking adequate water, if you're exercising every day, if you're eating a plant-based diet, we live in a self-healing, self-cleansing organism which will naturally be throwing off waste every day and you rebound every day. You know what your rebounder is? That's your lymphatic stimulator. When you rebound every day, it's helping the body cleanse the tissues. You have a pump, it's called the heart and it pumps blood all through the body. And you have a second heart. Do you wonder how the blood gets back to the heart? We've got a second heart, it's called your calf muscle. And to stimulate your calf muscle, all you have to do is that. <laughs> That's why when you're sitting on the plane, they tell you to move your feet up and down because it's stimulating your second heart, your calf muscle. And the exercise that stimulates your calf muscle better than any other exercise is rebounding because you're constantly springing on that rebound mat. And it's the best cure for varicose veins because this, the pump that gets your 
Venus system working is the rebounder. It strengthens those calf muscles that are getting that blood back to the heart. Your capillary system has little muscles all around it. So when your heart pumps, those little muscles are, are pumping all the way through. And when you work your, your calf muscle, it's pumping it all back. But your lymphatic system does not have a pump. Let me draw your lymphatic system. It's like a lot of little canals and they have gates all the way along. And when you wake up in the morning, all those gates are shut. And when you get on the rebounder and you're jumping on the rebounder, when you're up to the height of the jump, every gate opens. When you hit the mat, every gate closes. When you hit the height, every gate opens. When you hit the mat, every gate closes. Can you see a pumping, happen, pumping action happens? So remember what your lymphatic system, it's your body's vacuum cleaner. It sweeps away waste from the tissues. And when you rebound in the morning, you, you start up your lymphatic system. And all you have to do is walk from the kitchen to the lounge room, scratch your head, just all these little activities keep that lymphatic system going all through the day. Eosinophils are a very interesting white blood cell because when you have an allergy, eosinophil levels can rise. So at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, I take a drop of blood, put it under the microscope and it comes up on the screen and it shows you all your white blood cells and all your red blood cells. And if a person has an allergy to wheat, dairy, you will see more eosinophils. So in that drop of blood, I should see about two eosinophils. And eosinophils, you can tell because they light up like a bright, like a little light on a Christmas tree compared to the other white blood cells that are a duller white. Because we have a dark field condenser and so you've got a black background, so the white blood cells really light up. Now, if someone has five or six eosinophils, that's an indication that they are gluten sensitive. If they have uh, 10 eosinophils, they are intolerant to gluten. If they have 16, 17, 18 eosinophils, they are celiac, so that's a severe intolerance. Some people, when I say, oh, you're gluten intolerant, they say, no, 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 I've had a blood test. Or some people even have a biopsy of their colon, please don't do that, to test for celiac. And the doctor says, no, I'm not celiac. I said, no, you're not celiac, but you are gluten intolerant. Now, the test will never show the intolerance. It'll never show the, the sensitivity. So how can you tell? I've got a very easy way to tell. Stop all wheat for two months and see how you feel. How easy is that? <laughs> see how you feel. You can have a slice of bread and it'll be out of your body in 24 hours. But the effect can remain for nearly two months. So you really have to stop it for two months. Don't start tonight. Don't start tomorrow. Don't start until your cupboards are well stocked. You can get some very nice gluten-free uh, pastas now. San Remo, they've got a great section. It used to be that if you cooked gluten-free pasta, it just went like a lump of glue. But today you can get some very nice gluten-free pastas. Just go into the Asian section and you get rice noodles, rice vermicelli noodles. There's so many options today. And you can get spelt sourdough bread. If someone's celiac, they can't even handle that. Because as you'll see tomorrow night when we look at the acid alkaline lecture, the spelt has a little bit of gluten, but it's a less complex type. So usually people that are intolerant and sensitive can handle that one. It's a good idea to stop it all and then try introducing. So after two months, have a slice of bread, see what happens. The most common symptoms are actually brain fog and bloating. And how many people have that and think it's age? Have you heard of poor old age? It gets blamed for so many things. 
So we had this guy who used to be forgetting things all the time. I used to say to him, my friends blame the fact that they're 50. What are you going to blame? He was 18. <laughs> and, then, and then we discovered he was gluten intolerant. And when he stopped the gluten, wow, he started to remember everything. Do you know, life should be good. Life should be very good. We've only got one life. And we should be enjoying every moment of it. Let me tell you the story of one man who I saw when I was in Bermuda in May. He came to see me because he found out he had eosinophilia. I said, oh. He said, what can I do? I said, do you know what a rise in eosinophils is caused from? <laughs> a gluten and a dairy intolerance. I said, just stop the gluten and the dairy. He says, is that it? I said, yeah, but give it two months. I looked at the slide of one guy and he had 10 eosinophils and I said, wow, you've got an intolerance. He said, this is ridiculous. He said, I haven't even been eating it. And then he went, oh, the muffin on the plane. <laughs> that was enough to, to bring it all up. So what's the best way to boost your immune system? The best way to boost your immune system is have a quick cold shower at the end of every hot shower. How simple is that? And you'll get used to it and you'll go, <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> One lady said, Barbara, you say we've got to listen to our bodies and my body says, don't have a cold shower after the hot. <laughs> it doesn't like it. <laughs> you see, we're warm-blooded creatures. Of course, we're not going to like it, but it's just brief. It won't kill you and it actually won't make you cold. So every day at Misty Mountain Health Retreat, I run up hills, that boosts the immune system. I get quite hot on my way back home, I've got a little bag near the creek and I jump in the cold creek. In the winter, I'm in there seven seconds. I'm not in there long enough to get a cold. Dive out, yeah, I dive out as quick as I dive in. <laughs> and people are getting colds all the way around me and I don't get them. In fact, when I was at Misty Mountain uh, two weeks ago, I got a cold for four hours. Don't you love it? I blew my nose and sneezed and for four hours. How nice <laughs> when that's all it is. But you can take some herbs that will really knock a cold on the head. And if you go to YouTube, Barbara Annual Poultices, in that lecture, I give a recipe for the flu bomb. Now the flu bomb contains garlic, ginger, lemon, honey, eucalyptus oil and cayenne pepper. Got that? <laughs> and if you take that three times a day, your, your cold will not last very long. Did you know that on the packet where the flu injections, holds the flu injections, it states that this will not prevent the flu. So I do hope you don't have a flu injection because it does have mercury in it. And we don't need to inject these things into our body because the body's been designed to heal itself. And it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. Are there any questions before we close? Yes. Have we got a microphone? A microphone, there's one. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I do have IBS, and when it comes to seasoning the food, I, I noticed that in your book you use Celtic salt. My kids and I use um, um, Himalayan salt and um, some savoury yeast flakes and maybe sometimes we use some stock. Do we need to use all that or is just Celtic salt sufficient? When I flavour foods, I use the Celtic salt. I don't use any stock cubes because I've yet to find stock cubes that don't have hydrogenated vegetable protein or hydrogenated vegetable oils, which are other names for MSG. Do you know what they're using for MS, a name they're giving to MSG now? Natural flavour enhancer. How scary is that? 
and I use fresh herbs. Grow your fresh thyme. Put them in just before you serve your meal. They're fantastic. I use good quality olive oils. And if I want a dish, maybe a soup, to have a bit more spark, I'll dissolve a little bit of miso into hot water and that gives a richness to the soup. So use your fresh herbs, use your good quality salts and oils and you will not need flavour enhancers. I never used yeast flakes because it is yeast. Any questions? Yeah. Ah. We'll just follow, we'll get to you. Hello Barbara, I'd like to thank you for your talks. Dale is my name. I've spent 47 years in horticulture, agriculture. I've watched the breakdown of uh, a lot of our foods through our crops and all the rest. Uh, one of the key questions that I would like to ask you though, however, is uh, with regards to water, how would you, uh, or what would you suggest to the people here about how to purify their water? How to purify your water? You know, the chlorine can be evaporated quite quickly by just, you know, sitting it on the bench. In a few hours, the chlorine is evaporated. It's the fluoride that's the hardest to get out. And my husband has started his own political party. It's called the Involuntary Medication Objectors Party, objecting against the gov government forcing parents to vaccinate their children when it's not proven that they prevent disease, but also, um, objecting against putting fluoride in the water. A whole town will object to it and yet they will still put it in the water. And the fluoride in the water is toxic and it only hardens the outside of the teeth. So why do we have to drink it and why do we have to bathe in it? You see, it, it, it defies reason. So how do, you, how do you purify your water? A reverse osmosis is one process that will get the fluoride out and they have developed those filtering candles now, you know those little units you can put in those ceramic water filter things and they have developed one now that will get the fluoride out of the water. So you've just got to investigate to make sure the water you're drinking is pure water. Because I know, oh, sorry. I know that they, sorry, I know that they are suggesting to us to drink more tap, you know, they're at us all the time with regards to that. But what I have found over the years, uh, in particularly on our crops, we first started out with uh, pretty much chlorination of water and I've always looked upon it, they say that we shouldn't drink uh, normal rainwater because, oh, that's hard water. And I can see the effect that's having not on our, only our animals, but also on us as well. But then they went and added uh, the fluoride, just as you're speaking of, and now they're adding ammonium and uh, ammonia and all that as well. And there is another one that I have detected that I haven't been able, I, I can never seem to remember it. But as I suggest to people, if it was me, I was brought up basically on reservoir water, dam water, boiled, uh, case of liver fluke or anything like that or some of the things that can get in dam water or even some of the stream waters depending uh, but yeah I, I just you know. but can you see that if you drink rainwater or dam water and you've got strong hydrochloric acid mm. that actually wipes it out mm. so we're getting back to making sure you've got good hydrochloric acid too but I think the body can cope better with microbes in water, then it can cope with fluoride or ammonia or chlorine in water. So yes, it, it's a good point to make sure that you're drinking pure water. Thank you. I just wanted the ingredients for the flu bomb again. <laughs> okay, it's uh, garlic, so it's six things, garlic, ginger, so those two go together, and then lemon and honey, and eucalyptus oil, but remember only one drop of that, not half a cup, and cane pepper as much as you can handle. And then you put that with a little hot water. There's the flu bomb. Yes? Is yogurt good for you? Is yogurt good for you? Yogurt is fantastic for you. 
but if it comes from unhealthy cows, it's not going to be good for you. But you can get some very nice coconut yogurts today. In fact, I've been having some for breakfast every day. Very nice. Another question? Oh, there. We'll come back. We've got a microphone. Bar Barbara, for myself personally, uh, it's been very exciting to uh, come to one of these lectures with my brother. Uh, we're very becoming more and more conscious about what we're eating at home and that sort of thing. Because I suffer from um, diabetes, I just wanted to ask you, we've got some stevia, is that okay to use? Stevia? Yeah. Yes. Uh, can I have it with my cereal? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'll do. Because I'm going to uh, try and get off uh, refined sugars, no refined sugars, and I've cut down on caffeine. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> There was another question there. I had a question in regards to um, the circadian, circadian rhythms yeah. of the sun and um, what is it that determines um, what's the best bedtime? Is it the, when the sun sets or is it when the sun rises first thing in the morning? Um, light and dark signals are fed through the optic nerve to a control centre in the brain where your body clock communicates and your body clock um, is your suprachiasmatic nucleus, you might know that, and that communicates with the pineal gland. So it's the light and dark signals that are resetting your circadian rhythm. And the figures are showing that by no at 9 p.m. to 2 a.m., that's when the hormones are released that are responsible for rest, rejuvenation, healing, house cleaning, anabolism, all of that's happening in those hours. And is it possible to use the blue light from your phone to adjust that time hour range to what best suits you? So if you were to use your phone, <laughs> the blue light on your phone up until 9 p.m. and then you, have, you plan to go to bed at 10 p.m., could you change that 9 p.m. being the best time to 10 p.m. being the best time? Well, I've got some good news. In about two weeks, it will be 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> But, but the blue light from the sunlight is the main setter of the, of the circadian rhythm. And it is true that your technology gives off blue light, but it's a different frequency. And probably it is most dangerous at night because the body knows it's had the sunlight and now it needs that, uh, the night lights. So, no, nah, sorry, you can't play with that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi Barbara, um, if we're going to attempt to grow our own vegetables and if the soil is depleted of nutrients, um, if we wanted to add a more healthier soil or a compost that doesn't contain mushrooms, you talked about that containing being a fungus, um, if we want to stay away from manures which are animal well, the, what animal, you, what the animal manures aren't a problem unless the animals have been given drugs. But the wonderful thing about the microbes in the soil is they can break all that down. And that's why your compost is so important. And there are companies that will make compost for you. <laughs> and you can actually buy the compost. But you can make your own compost. You just have to have a place where you can actually put it but it's the microbes in the soil that are transforming um, all those nutrients into usable nutrients by the plants. So the, <coughs> the key is the, the microbes, the microbes in the soil. And that's, that's what the compost gives you. But every time you grow a crop and you harvest it, you shouldn't put another crop in until you feed that soil and the best is the compost. So all your manures should be composted. All your plants should be composted. Just in regards to that compost, with your compost bin, should that be in the sun or the shade or a bit of both? Oh, probably a bit of both. Yeah. Oh, good day, Barbara. Uh, a bit nervous, but i um, got a question. Being in Australia, it is a meat-eating country a lot of uh, cattle and uh, sheep, and uh, even New Zealand will be a big uh, uh, meat-eating country. What recommendation, 
per month should one eat? Well, I'm a vegetarian and I don't eat meat, so I actually don't advocate meat, but I do acknowledge that some people want to eat meat and it is their choice to do that. But if they ask my advice, it must be organic. Because the animals today, they're given so many drugs. I mean, a lot of cows today, they don't even eat grass. And a lot of disease is happening because of the meat. The only way a human being can get away with eating meat and not be sick from it is to have a very small amount. In the book, The China Study, Dr. Colin Campbell, he shows that he could he could switch cancer on and off by the amount of meat and, and animal products he was giving those rats. So the only time that, he, that the cancer didn't turn on with animal products was when they ate 5% animal products, which is a very small amount. Okay, I'm given the, the sign that time is up. <laughs> 